Welcome to The Secrets of Success. By following the proven techniques of the guests who appear on this series, you'll learn that even successful people run into detours and failures, and how you can apply their success techniques to change your life. You're now listening to the most unique show on radio, the show dedicated to making you a success. Do you really want to be a sports agent? Today's super agent, Hughes Norton, will help us decide. Hughes, thanks for being with us today. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me on. Now, you've just come out with the book Rainmaker. And first of all, it's become one of my favorite. I told you, I love this. This this is a book I literally could not put down. How would you define what a rainmaker is? It's basically someone doesn't have to be a sports agent or a uh, an entertainment agent. I, I look at it, William, as a person who generates income for a business by attracting clients or brokering deals for those clients, or in my case, both. Now, you worked for, I guess it would be called the biggest sports agent uh, representative company and represented some of the top golfers in the world. Give us a little bit of that background. Yeah, the background was the company is International Management Group, which uh, was founded by uh, a fellow named Mark McCormick in the late 50s, early 60s. He's the father of sports management, beyond any shadow of a doubt, created the business when there was none. Um, And today, of course, we have thousands and thousands of agents in all walks of sport. But Mark was the first. He started out on a hot streak. His first three clients, William, were Arnold Palmer, Jack Nicklaus, and Gary Player. So he said it was like hitting the lottery. uh, And he felt like the luckiest man in the world. And then he had to make a decision. Um, He could live a very uh, comfortable uh, million-dollar lifestyle representing those three. Or he could take what he had learned representing athletes who um, before that time had had no representation basically they were whether it was golfers tennis players team sport athletes all were doing it on their own and mark thought it was the you know divide in the road do i stay comfortably here with these three for the rest of my life or do i take what i've learned um, representing them and managing their careers and take it to other areas where people need help tennis players football players basketball players hockey players etc He took the latter route, and um, I joined the company about 10 years after it started, way back in the early 1970s. Totally serendipitous uh, uh, situation for me. I met Mark when he gave a lecture at Harvard Business School, where I was a second-year student, um, wondering what I was going to do with my life, and uh, approached him, uh, wrote him, got an interview, was hired, and he quickly sent me out on the pro golf tour to represent some of IMG's existing clients and also sign as many promising young new ones as possible. And in the end, I was fortunate enough or skilled enough or some combination of the two, I guess, to sign and represent six number one golfers, uh, six players that were ranked number one in the world at one point in their careers. And in chronological order, those were Tom Watson, Nancy Lopez, who became and still is uh, one of the greatest women golfers of all time. Curtis Strange, two-time U.S. Open winner. Greg Norman, who basically needs no introduction, (laughs) one of the greatest international players of all time. Uh, David Duvall, and in the end, Tiger Woods. So, (laughs) did okay. Just a few names we might have heard of, and I want to stress something, uh, Hughes, to our audience. We may have some younger members who... When you say you represented three of the top golfers, Arnold Palmer, Jack Nicklaus, Gary Player, this was the top of the heap. I mean, if you took those three out of the pile, maybe three or four others won tournaments during the year, if I recall, maybe five or six, if if even that many. But that was the meat and potatoes of the golf world. Am I correct? Well, you're absolutely correct. Consider this, William. In the 1960s, the first seven years, 60, 61, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, Arnold, Gary, and Jack won every single Masters tournament. <laughs> so how'd you like to be the agent of those three? I, I definitely would, but I think it's more that it looks easy. And that's my next question. We all think of being an agent as something cool. And once you sign the player, you'll get good seats. You'll be at these big events, et cetera, et cetera. But as I was reading your book, I got the strongest feeling that this is more like being an associate at a law firm. You're working very hard and 
perhaps 24, uh, well, not 24 hours a day, you have to sleep sometime. But most of your waking time, you're subject to a call from them or your boss saying what's doing. Did we get this contract, et cetera? Uh, if a contract comes in, you're looking over it to know what's involved in there. If he's involved with some tax laws, I think there was, I'm not sure if I remember which one, but it made a big difference which state they played in or bought a house in into millions of dollars based on the tax law in that state. So you really have to be a jack of all trades and keep the golfer happy. Am I saying it correctly? Very, very true. And and uh, invariably, um, in terms of lifestyle, the clients who would call you needed to speak to you at e- in the evening <laughs> when you were f- through with work at the office, but they had just gotten off the golf course. They couldn't talk to you during the day. So any semblance of normal family life or home time goes out the window. Uh, you're beholden to your clients. They've, they've hired you and they're uh, paying you a lot of money. And uh, it, it sort of never ends. Interesting sidebar here, William. The word agent, when Mark started the business, really pertained to entertainment agents. There were no sports uh, managers or agents in those days. And from day one, Mark McCormick despised the term agent. In his words, and this is going back to the entertainment angle, he said, agent is a fat, bald guy <laughs> booking bands with a pocket full of quarters out of a phone booth. I realize a lot of those terms I just used will not mean anything to some of our younger listeners. But yes, we used to go into a phone booth and put coins in and uh, make calls that way. But Mark said, agent, I am not. I am a manager of careers. I'm a mentor. I'm a confidant of the people I work for. A much broader definition of the job than simply booking somebody like a band into next week's appearance at a club. It really did come across in your book that you do so much more because, again, most of us think with the baseball player, once they're signed to the kind, okay, they're done. But there's so much off the course. And I think just to give an example, and I hope I have these numbers correctly, uh, Arnold Palmer, one of the, if not the top golfer at that time in the world and loved by people, you took his off course income from six thousand dollars a year to over five hundred thousand a year in two years. Is that correct? That's correct. And Mark did that, of course, in the early days of the practice. And Mark said, and we talk about this in the book, he said, I felt like Robin Hood. He said, when I looked at the contracts these guys were signing, um they were getting ripped off right and left. I, I was actually liberating them from from an act from a ridiculous sort of servitude to the companies that they were signed with and and products they were endorsing. And there's lots of stories in the book about those early years with Arnold. But it became uh, a real revelation to Mark and to the players that, hey, it doesn't have to be this way. We can actually tip the pendulum a little bit more to the player side than to the corporate side. And I, I, doing the math on that, and we talked about it a little before the show, that's something like a hundredfold increase from 6,000 to 500,000. It's a little less than a hundredfold increase. But I think any of us, if we had a part-time job, if you said you could multiply our part-time earnings by 10 times, we would be extremely happy. And when I say part-time, you're only talking about off-the-course income, shirts, golf balls, golf clubs, maybe a food product, uh, something like that. Am I correct? Correct. And if you fast forward 35 odd years from those Arnold Palmer beginning days and consider that when Tiger Woods turned pro, I arranged for him to sign contracts before he hit a single shot as a professional worth $60 million, all guaranteed, no matter how he played, and with only two companies. I mean, the growth of the sport and we trace a lot of that in the book. I think that, that that's of interest to, to people that like golf, William. It isn't just my story, an agent's story behind the scenes of what really goes on representing players. That's fascinating in and of itself. But we also track the growth of the pro tour, which when I started even in the early 1970s, was essentially a mom and pop operation compared to what it's grown to today. And then we also chronicle the growth of IMG, and we've touched on that a little bit. But it's fascinating to see how Mark went from from hitting the lottery, so to speak, with the big three, Arnold, Jack, and Gary, and developed the company into this behemoth global juggernaut uh, sports management and representation firm that really has set the bar for all the other agencies that have come since. And I like the term that your boss, Mark McCormick, used. 
the how did he call it uh career management i guess was that the term correct because he said i'm a manager of careers i'm not an agent don't call me an agent i'm far more than that i'm much more than that and i know from your book that's what you've been doing it, it's there were so many things i had no concept that an agent does that they're involved in and the details involved even if the player was signing a contract on golf balls what you got for him was so much more and tied him into it for a longer time and limited the, um, um, I guess, volatility that a company could just dump the player if they wanted willy-nilly. They were basically locked in. Hughes, before we go any further, I'd like to let our audience know if you're just tuning in, you're listening to The Secrets of Success on the voice of Nassau Community College 90.3 WHPC. I'm your host, Bill Horan. Our guest today is Hughes Norton, and if you recognize that name, there's a reason. He's the agent for many super pro golfers, and he just came out with a book, Rainmaker, and if you want a good read, get hold of this book. It's very interesting. It'll teach you a lot about what an agent does have to do and about his career, so it's both interesting and educational all at the same time. Hughes, if someone is out there thinking, they want to be an agent. What advice would you give them? What skills are perhaps the most important in being an agent? I think for sure, salesmanship is right at the top of the list, Bill. You've got to be able to sell yourself, and in my case, my company, but also yourself, because you're going to be working one-on-one with that with that golfer. And you've, you've got to be able to make the pitch and close the sale with your recruits. And then you have to be able to sell and close with the various companies for the endorsements that you're seeking for those for those uh, clients of yours. So that's key. Communication is big. You have to be able to not only interpersonally get along well and communicate with your client and all the people that he deals with and the companies that he's affiliated with, but you've got to be able to write. Um, you've got to be able to express yourself in proposals and write good marketing plans So uh, writing and and communication are big. You've got to probably right at the top of the list, be able to ignore the criticism that inevitably comes with um, representing a player. Agents aren't the most popular occupation, as you probably know. And uh, you also got to be willing to work. We touched on it earlier, you know, not 24 seven, but pretty darn close um, in terms of devotion to your client. It's not just, his career on the golf course. It's all the stuff off. It's his family. It's his lifestyle. It's the ups and downs. You're almost a, uh, yeah, we talked about it earlier, a confidant, almost a uh, rabbi for your clients from time to time. And it's, uh, and I guess the final thing would be for sure, ability to multitask as <laughs> there's so much going on with one player and you're representing three, four, five at the same time. They're all different. They all have different needs. They all have different um, situations going on in their life, whether their age, their career. So it's uh, kind of a combination of all those things. I would think if you're giving a talk at the high school, teachers from each department would love you. You talked about communication, sales skills, uh, writing skills. And I know from reading your book, th- this is also true. As I said, I was taken a bit aback because I thought like most people, oh, it's the cool profession. Once you get that guy signed, you're just raking in the money and you can kind of sit back and go to a lot of good dinners and probably have box seats at any game you want. And uh, instead, it looks like a 24-hour-a-day job where if if your client calls you at midnight or if he's in another time zone, you better be there because he wants an answer quickly. And uh, <laughs> I think you're making there's, all there's teachers of, happy. There, there's some of that, of course, Bill, you touched on. I mean, just think, you know, people would say, what are you doing next week, Hughes? I'd say, oh, geez, I got to go to the Masters, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> tough, so tough life. It, it, and and it, you have to be careful to smell the, smell the roses a little bit as you go through this and not be caught up in, in so much of the, the, the detail and all the, all the work that we just discussed. But it's pretty fun to have that front row seat in my case, at, at the major championships of golf for nearly 30 years. That never gets old. <laughs> Our agents' uh, personality, is it different between the different sports? Like, do you find baseball agents, football, basketball, are they different than golf agents, or it, can, can they all just come out of the same pond? Well, we were at IMG siloed, so to speak. Uh, those who worked in the golf division did only that as a rule. Our tennis people all only work with tennis players and tennis tournaments. Our team sport people only with football, basketball, hockey players, et cetera. 
So an intern or someone walking in the door for an interview doesn't get sized up at our firm like, oh, this is a this is a football agent for sure. Um, some of that helps if the guy was a football player previously, for example, he can relate a little bit better. But one of the better agents we had at IMG, Peter Johnson, uh, was a football player at the University of Delaware, good enough to go to NFL training camp with two different teams. And he came in and within six months, I had him helping me manage Nancy Lopez. So it's a cross current. It's 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 personalities. It's you got you got to have some empathy for sure because of all the different types of people that you work with. But it's not um, oh this guy's a golf agent and this guy is something else in a different sport or whatever. Hughes, I'm just uh, as you're answering that question. I'm just thinking, when something goes wrong, is it always the agent's fault? Uh, they say, of course, <laughs> of course, hundred percent. And and the hardest part is is hearing over and over again that never fails at various times in each of your clients' careers the phrase, "Hey, what are you doing for me lately?" Or worse, "What have you done for me lately?" There's a a very short term memory, Bill, about the, the achievements that they thought were wonderful and and uh, unprecedented six months ago and today. Okay, what's what's going on now? What are you what are you generating for all these fees that I'm paying for you? So that's um, that's always in the back of your mind. How about men and women as clients? Does it make any difference if you're w- representing women athletes? Are they nicer in some respects and meaner in some others, or or are they all basically the same? I I don't think you can generalize that way. I think I think we've had successful uh, uh, men represent women tennis players and women represent tennis women tennis players. You know, it's it's. There's probably, you know, I can't really speak for women, but um, obviously there's a little more empathy perhaps in a, in a relationship between a woman agent and a woman uh, athlete. Um, but it, the converse was also true. We had plenty of successful relationships with people like Nancy Lopez or Laura Baugh, in my case, um, in, in, in golf that it didn't make any difference. When I went through your book, Rainmaker, uh, one of the things I was amazed at, there was so many side deals, and I mean legitimate side deals that you could make and income for players that they had never thought of. Can you tell us some of the, uh, whether it's clothing or uh, appearance fees, et cetera, that players are engaged in that most of us just wouldn't even think of? Well, it just takes imagination. You know, you, you basically have an athlete and, and they the most visible Things that you see are the golf clothes, you know, shirts, slacks, uh, um, women's apparel in the case of a woman player, the golf shoes that they wear, the hat that they wear, if they do indeed wear one uh, and so forth. We got very creative uh, to the point of today. It's almost like NASCAR, which is a little bit over the top, in my opinion. And we would we would take a player who had a clothing deal with Reebok, for example, Greg Norman in this case, and we put a corporate patch uh, which was very creative in Greg's case. I, I got him a deal with McDonald's and they had the Golden Arches uh, logo, which is so familiar and, and known worldwide. And that appeared in color, matching the color of his shirts very tastefully on his left sleeve. So in, in addition to having Reebok and his own shark logo mark on the front of his shirt, we put this corporate logo on the sleeve. And, and that wasn't, it, you see it a lot today, but we kind of started that whole ball rolling. And it was creativity. It was imagination. It was it was you know trying to come up with things that in this case the player didn't have to really do much. He just had to wear the logo. I mean, it, it, and you're always trying to minimize the amount of time, Bill, because players have to practice. They have to play competitively. They have to travel. They have to rest. And mixed in with all the wonderful corporate deals that we're talking about are obligations, photo sessions, sales meeting appearances interviews that takes a player's time and inevitably it's time away from what they think they should be doing which is getting better at their craft practicing and of course that's they're not wrong in saying that because the better they are the easier and more lucrative your job can be for them and and money coming in but on the other side they do need a break like everybody else i guess and it's only fair to give them a little time off and we talk about this in the book the, the balance required and it's any walk of life, your life, my life, whatever field of it or enterprise you're in, the balance that you need to strike in your own life between work and family or between work and rest. And golfers, with each endorsement or licensing arrangement that we would arrange for them, 
are committing more time to the fulfillment of that endorsement commercial contract. And that's time away from, we just mentioned it, practicing, playing, getting better. So what's the right balance? Do you do as many deals as you possibly can to maximize your income? Because quite frankly, you never know when your game is going to leave you. It happens. Or do you say, I'm so good that I'm going to focus totally on golf. I'll do a couple of side endorsement deals, but I'm going to minimize that and maximize the other. There's no right answer. Every player comes to their own sort of balance, um, but it's always on your mind. Am I overcommitting my client? Am I doing the right thing to do another deal for him, et cetera? Uh, Hughes, again, before we go further, I'd like our audience to know if you're just tuning in, you're listening to The Secrets of Success on the voice of Nassau Community College 90.3 WHBC. I'm your host, Bill Horan. Our guest today is Hughes Norton. He is the author of the book, Rainmaker, and what we might call a super agent, representing all of the top golfers in the world, literally. And he's giving us some instructions today. And uh, Hughes, this book is out. I want everybody to know, if you want a good read, the book, simple one word, Rainmaker. I I think it's instructive. It uh, shows the younger people how much work is involved in a profession like this. But also, if you work hard and do that work, there can be a lot of rewards if you're following what your teachers are telling you and the instructions in your book. Going further, can you tell us what lessons did you personally learned from the people you represented, if any? <laughs> well, as you go along, you kind of, and I talk about this in my my agent's 10 commandments, Bill, you, you learn that it's important with your clients, for example, and McCormick drilled this into all of us, is to, to do what you say you're going to do and be credible. And, and if possible, do more than you say you're going to do, but never over-promise always under promise and over deliver and going further sweating the details. You know, you Mark always preached that if your client sees small things taken care of, well, he or she develops confidence that you'll handle the big things well. And that's important. And then most of all, I think is being accountable, you know, take ownership of your mistakes. A lot of people that have read this book so far, including some of my former clients said, you know what? What I like best is that Hughes doesn't just tell all the great stuff that he did. He tells the mistakes and the bad as well as the good. And that was me trying to live up what Mark taught us as managers of, of, of athletes is to take ownership of your mistakes. That, again, builds your client's trust. And trust, Bill, is the foundation of these relationships. When the player starts in any way, shape, or form not to trust your advice, not to trust your counsel, you're on the road to a breakup pretty quickly. You represented a fellow I think most of us have heard of, somebody named Tiger Woods. Yeah, uh, I've heard of him. Can, can, you, <laughs> can you summarize that? I'm getting in 30 seconds because I know there's uh, probably uh, 50 pages of the book talking about him in one form or another. You actually noticed him early on in life when he was little more than a high school student, I guess, maybe even before he wasn't, that. Yep, exactly, before then. Um, you know, you can't start early enough. I'd like to tell you that all of my uh, early recruiting produced nothing but superstars, but uh, over and over again, the can't miss prospects would in fact miss. Uh, Tiger was a can't miss from a very early age. I first went to uh, see Tiger and his family when he was 12 years old. And uh, it was kind of ridiculous really, because in those days, nobody ever turned pro as a golfer till usually they were through with college or, or at least three years along in college. So I'm there, you know, 10 years early, but the kid was so good at such a young age, as I said, that I was able to establish a relationship with he and his family, ended up hiring his dad, kind of a brilliant move, actually, in hindsight, to be our junior talent scout, because he was going to all these junior tournaments around the country with Tiger. And uh, so Earl would actually file reports back to IMG about this prospect or this kid or whatever. And we were able to further strengthen our a relationship with him in the, in the uh, beginning days because we hired him and paid his expenses and paid him a salary. So all kinds of things like that go into recruitment. Um, but Tiger was probably the can't miss us, missed of the can't miss, right? <laughs> I mean, he was, he, if anybody was going to be good, it was someone who not only won three consecutive U.S. junior amateurs, but then three consecutive U.S. amateur champions. Nobody's ever done that in the history of the sport, not Bobby Jones, not Jack Nicklaus, nobody. And so 
the writing was on the wall. I was fortunate and I guess brilliant at the same time to have forged this relationship early. And uh, it became a, a fantastic commercial success for Tiger as well as IMG. And that's kind of a modest overview uh, and tell our audience for, for people who may not be golfers. Once Tiger Woods came on, golf courses that were virtually empty, you could call up the local Muni course and get a time maybe in 20 minutes. They then became filled. People who never played golf before were getting out and playing, using these products. Do you have any idea, In and I know the numbers in millions, maybe even higher than that, uh, how much income was literally generated for him off the course? In his career, I think it's fair to say I was only involved with the first two and a half years of it. But in his 25-year career, I mean, hes they say today he's worth a billion dollars net worth. Um, I think maybe that's a little high, but um, we were generating right away, Bill. Um, this is in 1996 dollars, okay? He was making, you know, 15, 20 million dollars a year, which at the time was more not only than icons of the sport like Greg Norman and Arnold Palmer, but Michael Jordan was not making as much at Nike as Tiger did in the first year of his deal. So kind of puts things in perspective. He's made a ton. He's earned it. He's he's if he's not the greatest of all time, he's second behind Jack Nicholas. And uh, further, he's inspired a whole wave of, you know, we called it Tiger mania when he came out, because as you mentioned, everybody all of a sudden golf became cool. You know, here's this exactly. young kid and golfers, you know, historically had been a country club kind of all white sort of stuffy upper class sport. At least it was for decades. And Tiger came along. And, and and completely transformed it in terms of its appeal. It really, you, you've given us a wonderful overview of everything. I can't thank you enough. I want our audience once again to remember the title of the book, Rainmaker. If you want a good read, it doesn't matter. This is not one of those books where you have to be a golfer to appreciate it. I think anybody can. It's by our guest, Hughes Norton, N-O-R-T-O-N. And uh, who's the publisher, Hughes? It's uh, Simon & Schuster, an imprint of the Simon & Schuster publishing firm called Atria. A-T-R-I-A, and it's already um, making waves, Bill. I mean, we're number one on the best new books in golf on Amazon, both uh, Kindle and hardcover, and uh, it hasn't even come out yet, so we're, we're pretty excited. Well, it deserves it. I'll tell you, I really loved reading it. Sometimes I have to cut down how much of a book I have time to read between shows, but this one, page to page, cover to cover, everything, and I'm hoping you're going to come out with Rainmaker Part 2 or Volume 2, etc. in the future because it was such a good read. Hughes, thanks for being with us today. Bill, you're very kind. Appreciate it, and a pleasure to be with you. I'd like our audience to know that you've been listening to The Secrets of Success on the voice of Nassau Community College 90.3 WHBC. I'm your host, Bill Horan, asking you to please join us again next week at the same time when we'll continue our journey to success.